Hi, Dave Roscoe here. I'm much calmer today um, because I did get the information I was looking for, and I, I have a lot to talk about today, but I do want to um, address some of the comments from yesterday's video. Several people called me out for spreading FUD, and that was not my intention. The topic of the video was more to do with something that doesn't invalidate the project, but was indicative of a more systemic problem. And, and I did say in the video that I still believe in the Pi Network, and that was true yesterday when I was frustrated, um, and it remains true today. But I get it, you know, maybe that message did not come across, and people were thinking that I was softening on my commitment to the Pi Network. And I just want to let people know that that's not the case. I still believe very much in the Pi Network. I'm in this for the long haul. I mean, I've made it this far. I'm, there's no sense in quitting now. If you got that impression, I do apologize. Um, and I will do my best not to do that again in the future. Because as it turns out, the answer to this particular problem was there all along. It just wasn't easy to find. So some of the people who rather sarcastically said, oh, you need to read or join the community. Um, you know what? I am part of the community and I have been since the beginning. So I, I don't appreciate those comments, but you weren't wrong either. If I had put a little more time into digging into this, I would have found the one little paragraph that explained it. So let's get back to the job at hand. Um, the Pi coin as of this morning is trading at 94 cents, which is down by 6% from yesterday. The current circulating supply is 6.763 billion uh, Pi coin, which is coincidentally the exact same as yesterday. Locked migrations are down by 150,000 and unlocked migrations are up 150,000, which is exactly the same shift. What that means is, since yesterday, there have been no new migrations, and the shift here is simply the unlocking of locked migrations. The market volume is at uh, $296 million, which is up 41% in the last 24 hours. So regarding the circulating supply, as I indicated at, uh, at the introduction here, um, that mystery has been solved. The 14-day pending period is counted with the migrated locked balance. When those pending migrations were returned to the user's accounts, it caused a drop in the migrated locked supply, which resulted in a reduction in the total circulating supply. I still think it shouldn't do that. I think they should separate the pending from the actual locked migrated supply because those pending can be pulled back. That's up to them. But at least now we know for sure that that's exactly what's happening. It wouldn't hurt to update the white paper to make some of the tokenomics of the Pi network a little clearer. So I want to touch on some of the explanations from the comments of yesterday's video. And I got a lot of comments from people suggesting reasons why this was happening. So some of you had said that the forfeiting of Pi from accounts that had not passed KYC was responsible for the circulating supply drop. Any migration that goes past the 14-day pending and is deposited into a user's wallet, it cannot be recalled or burned. Therefore, it cannot be forfeited. So when you see forfeited Pi, it can only be from in-app balances, such as your unverified and transferable balances. That's what gets forfeited, and that never made it to the mainnet wallet, so it was never counted as part of the circulating supply. Uh, some of you also suggested the on-chain lockups. Now, if you don't know what that is, this is something that Pi rolled out relatively recently. It is a voluntary re-lockup option that's available to users. So if you had Pi that was previously locked up and it became unlocked, rather than letting it sit there unlocked, you could relock it. I don't know if that gives you 
uh, mining bonuses or not, because it's not done through the same interface as the um, migration lockups in the app, but it might, I don't know. I, I'm not going to speak what I don't know. If you do a on-chain lockup, that pie is already accounted for in the migrated unlock supply. When you relock it, it just switches to migrated locked supply. So the total circulating supply never changes. A few of you had uh, pointed out that um, DApp staking could be involved. And I hadn't considered that. It makes sense to me that it exists. However, that occurs from the migrated unlocked pie balance. The staking itself could either be managed completely by the DApp via its own smart contract, in which case it may never leave the migrated unlocked pie balance, or if it's intrinsically linked to the pie uh, blockchain and their own smart contracts, then it could revert back to migrated lock supply. But in any case, it never leaves the blockchain. So it's always accounted for in the circulating supply, regardless of where it goes. We've talked a lot about tokenomics and I wanted to touch upon this, uh, explain what it is for people who don't know, and then provide clarity on how that applies to the Pi network. I know I had originally said I want to talk about smart contracts, and I do, but I think this is a little more relevant um, considering um, the events from the last few days, and I think it's worthwhile to know. A lot of you have heard this term to tokenomics, but what is it? It's a short form of the words token economics. And it's a set of rules on how a crypto token works, how it's distributed, and what gives it value. It's like an um, economic blueprint for a crypto project. Most legitimate cryptocurrencies make their tokenomic model public. And it contains information like total supply, circulating supply, distribution, utility, incentives, and supply management, such as burning, staking, uh, inflation. From the Pi Network context, the total supply is 100 billion. The circulating supply is the total of migrated locked Pi and migrated unlocked Pi. And as we now know, migrated Pi in the 14-day pending period are considered migrated locked pie and are part of the circulating supply total. This is important because once coin is released to a wallet, it cannot be recalled, it cannot be burned. This was my concern. Um, the disappearing coin needed to have an answer, and now it does. It restores at least my faith that the blockchain is working the way it should and there's nothing weird going on. Now, regarding distribution, 65% of the total is available for mining. Whether or not it ever actually gets fully mined is not the point. It's that pool of, of the total that's available just for mining and nobody else can use it for anything. 20% goes to the Pi Core team. This is an often criticized number. It is absolutely their right to take it. A lot of people underestimate the value of a vision and the commitment and action needed to bring it to reality. If it was easy, we'd all be doing it. And we don't, because it's not easy. They have every right to claim 20%. And it's not unreasonable. It is a very common practice with cryptocurrencies. For example, Ethereum claimed 20% for its founders. Solana claimed 20%, Avalanche claimed 20%, Polygon claimed 23%, the Binance coin claimed 40%, Cardano 17%, Polkadot 30%. As you can see, 20% is not unreasonable. Not only that, it differs from a lot of these in that it is not instantly unlocked. The 20% that's allocated to the Pi Core team gradually unlocks as time passes and they realize the vision of the project. It is 
directly tied to the success of the project. So people who say that the PyCore team is going to dump all their coin and, and, and walk away with all this money, they don't have it. It unlocks over time. I just wanted to make that right. 10% of the total is for building the ecosystem. And 5% is for liquidity pools. Now, liquidity pools are just kind of like emergency funds or slush funds for different things that pop up. As far as utility goes, their utility statement is that they're trying to create a true digital currency that is easy to use, has low fees, fast transactions, and is decentralized. The uh, ecosystem will provide further utility by allowing PyCoin to be used in these ways through dApps and other strategic partnerships. Regarding incentives, the Pi Network has referral bonuses, utility bonuses, node bonuses, security circle bonuses, validator bonuses, and lockup bonuses. With regard to supply management, which is something that has been a topic for the last few days, you have inflationary and deflationary uh, mechanisms that are part of this. And with regards to um, inflationary, you have the mining rate reductions. So in other words, the mining rate for early adopters was much higher than it is today, and it will continue to go down uh, based on an algorithm of how many people are currently mining and even circulation. So that's one way they control supply. The migration algorithm is another way that they control supply because once it's released to your wallet, they have no more control over the supply. So their only gate for controlling supply is from the app to your wallet. And that migration is managed by an algorithm. People don't like how long they have to wait, but it is what it is. Now, there's a lot of things that are slowing up migrations, but even if everything were running great, there's no guarantee that migrations will be fast for everybody. And it depends on a lot of factors. But that's one way of controlling supply. And it is their right to do so. They can't just allow the coin to flood the market. That will destroy the coin and invalidate their vision. So regardless of how people want it to work, you're part of the Pine Network. You have to play by their rules. Um, KYC requirement, that's another way of controlling supply. By ensuring that everybody's a real person, they make the regulatory path smoother. Yeah, everyone complains about KYC and uses it as a way of saying that, you know, Pi is not decentralized. Uh, I don't think that at all. KYC does not make it a centralized process. Whether the KYC process itself is centralized, yeah, maybe it is now. Maybe in the future it won't be. Once KYC is passed, it has no bearing on how the blockchain executes. So the blockchain can be completely decentralized, but still have a centralized KYC. So that argument is kind of weak. Lockups are another way of controlling the supply. By implementing lockups, they provide a bonus for users in exchange for preventing their coin from entering the market. Because of these lockups, they can tell in advance how much coin is going to be released and at what time. And using this information, they can adjust other things such as their mining rates and the migration rates. These things all allow the flow of Pi to be controlled and hopefully achieve some sort of stability. We're not there yet. That's how it's done. Now, with regard to burning, um, burning is a deflationary um, approach, and it's unclear if that's ever gonna be a thing or if it's a thing now. I don't think so. Um, Someone had suggested they found evidence of burn wallets, and I'm going to follow up on that. But, you know, the Pi Core team did say that they would not burn coin, but rather return it to the mining pool. And that may be what they do. But it's up to them. And it's not set in stone. Putting the forfeited Pi back into the mining pool is effectively a type of burning. The mining rate now is much lower than it was five years ago, and it will be much lower five years from now. By putting the 
forfeited pie back into the mining pool, the likelihood that that pie will ever see circulation again goes down quite a lot. So if it can't ever enter circulation again, you could consider it burned. So as you can see, the Pi Network satisfies all of the hallmarks of other legitimate cryptocurrencies. Its biggest source of uncertainty for exchanges is its lack of transparency on the migration algorithm, the lack of transparency on inflationary and, de and deflationary mechanisms, and the issues with KYC. They're concerned about the delays and the problems with KYC because that affects the future speculation on how much pi is going to get out there. They also question the utility. They doubt that the project can achieve its goal, which I think is the weakest argument because there's a lot of garbage tokens out there that provide very little to no utility whatsoever other than providing a speculative tool for people to make a, a lot of money and for most people to lose a lot of money. So I think that's a weak argument. I honestly think that the Pi Network scares them because it doesn't work like other cryptos. This is something new and their potential for profits could be limited if this goes the way that the Pi Network or the Pi Core team wants this to go. That's all I've got for today. Hopefully you've learned something. I know I have in the past uh, 24 hours, and I do appreciate you all watching these videos, and I hope it continues to provide value. I am now, as ever, devoted to the Pi Network and the vision of the Pi Core team. So remember, the success of Pi Network begins with you. Pi to the moon. Peace.